Thank you. So my name is Jesse Pete Fort. Uh, I'm based here in Seattle, Washington, and I'm the deputy director for Sierra Club's Clean Transportation for All campaign. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, I think many of you are Sierra Club staff or volunteer leaders from Sierra Club chapters or local groups around the country, or you are trusted partners or Sierra Club members. And we hope that however you're coming to us today, you find this webinar informative and engaging and challenging. Um, a little about Sierra Club and our transportation work. Um, we work to reduce the harmful environmental and public health impacts of transporting people and goods while expanding equitable transportation options. So this means not only do we work on cleaner cars and trucks and policies related to those issues, but we also work critically to reduce our car dependence by advocating for issues or for things like reliable public transit, uh, safe infrastructure for people walking and biking, or more housing choices near where people work or learn or play. And all of that is why I'm so excited to be, to be moderating this discussion on the new book, When Driving is Not an Option, Steering Away from Car Dependence uh, by Anna Zivartz, who joins us today as one of our panelists. Um, and this book really focuses um, on people who are often found invisible in our transportation system. One third of people living in the United States do not have a driver's license. And their experience, this book focuses on their experiences using our transportation and mobility system, uh, a system that's designed almost exclusively for people driving cars. Um, the system has health and environmental and quality of life costs for everybody, uh, not just those that are excluded from it. So if we're serious about addressing climate change and inequality, we have to address these issues. And uh, I'd like to start now by introducing our, our two panelists today. Um, and then I'll start with some questions. Uh, a format note first, uh, I have a few questions for the panelists and then they're gonna talk to each other a little bit. And then we also have some time allotted for questions from anybody, any, any of you. Um, so look in the chat for a Q&A form um, and we'll drop it in the chat a few times today. And if you have a question that comes up while you're listening to folks, um, go ahead and fill out the form and then we'll review some questions and, and ask a few before the end of the hour. Uh, so let me introduce our speakers. Uh, first is Anna Zivart, the author uh, of When Driving is Not an Option, Steering Away from Car Dependency. Uh, Anna is a low vision parent and non-driver. Anna created the Week Without Driving Challenge and is passionate about bringing the voices of non-drivers to the planning and policy making tables. Uh, Anna sits on the boards of the League of American Bicyclists, the Pacific Northwest Transportation Consortium, and the Washington State Transportation Innovation Council. Uh, she also serves as a member of the Transportation Research Board's Committee on Public Health and Transportation and the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center Coordinating Committee. I think I got all that right. Uh, and our, our co-panelists today, Joshua Hodeck. Uh, Joshua began at the Sierra Club as a conservation organizer in 2005 and currently manages the North Star chapter's work on sustainable development and clean transportation. Uh, that's Minnesota, for everybody not familiar with Sierra Club chapters. Uh, for over a decade, Joshua has served on the Minneapolis Capital Long Range Improvement and Bicycle Advisory Committees and on the board of the Alliance for Metropolitan S Stability. Uh, Joshua is a year on bicycle commuter, uh, no small feat in Minneapolis, I assume, uh, lives a car light, in a car light household with his wife, daughter, and an occasional exchange student. Uh, Joshua is passionate about transit equity and ensuring that everyone has access to safe, convenient, and affordable clean transportation options and housing. Uh, Anna and Joshua, thank you so much for agreeing to chat with us today. Um, this is going to be really great. I'm excited. So I'm going to start with asking um, some easy questions. The first question is going to be for Anna. Uh, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about your experience as a non-driver and how it led you to write this book. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's really lovely to be here and uh, get to chat with folks from Sierra Club and uh, Minneapolis. And um, so my my experience as a non-driver and my reason for writing this book. So I was born with an eye condition called nystagmus. It's um, something that makes my eyes wiggle all the time. 
Um, and, and that reduces how far I can see. It reduces my ability to see distance, fast moving objects, basically makes it not safe for me to drive a car. And I, I grew up in a semi-rural part of Washington state and, you know, struggled as I became a teenager. I just, I had to get rides from friends and from my parents everywhere I wanted to go. And that felt really difficult. Didn't know how I was going to be an adult in the world without driving. Then I heard about a place called New York City where there was subways and they ran 24 hours a day. And I ended up there uh, after college. And that was really wonderful. And then uh, after I had a kid, I decided I wanted to be back closer to family. And I came back to Washington State. And that made me realize how... Um, I actually wasn't alone in my inability to drive, that there are many other folks all across Washington state and all of our states and all of our communities who can't drive either because of a disability, uh, because of age, because of income. And uh, all together, you know, there's a lot of us. And the, the, the idea behind this book was really to figure out how to make our stories more visible and how we can, um, by, by making ourselves more visible, making the needs of non-drivers more visible, start to change the conversation and build bigger coalitions to change how we, uh, how we create our built environment around car dependency. So that's, that's how I got here. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Joshua for a question too, just to introduce yourself. Um, You've been working on transportation in Minnesota for a long time, I think decades, plural, is probably right. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your transportation advocacy work in the state and how specifically you've incorporated the experiences and perspective of non-drivers, uh, especially involuntary non-drivers? Maybe that's a distinction we can talk about in a little bit too. So how, how have you incorporated that into your work in Minnesota? Sure. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me. And uh, Anna, I really did enjoy your 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 book. As you can see, I, I tabbed it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as Jesse said, I've been at this uh, for almost two decades now, working on land use and transportation for the Minnesota chapter of the Sierra Club. I support a, a team of volunteers. Uh, we started off as a sprawl committee uh, of our chapter and uh, broaden our work to uh, include both land use and transportation. Um, in mostly the, the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul region of the state, the most populous uh, urbanized, if you will, uh, part of the state, uh, but we work statewide. And uh, one of our, our big accomplishments uh, that took over a decade to, to, uh, to come to fruition was a, a state um, transportation funding package that uh, provided new significant ongoing long-term funding for transit and bicycling and walking uh, in the state uh, last year in 2023 legislative session. Um, besides working at the legislative uh, uh, level, we've also uh, get down to the project level um, in influencing decisions that actually happen on the, on the, on the street when the rubber uh, beats the road, if you will. Um, to get to your question though, Jesse, um, one of the things that uh, we really try to do is give a voice to people that are uh, non-drivers um, and uh, working with other organizations um, such as uh, the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance, ARP, National Federation for Blind in Minnesota and students, um, Really, and and Anna, you bring this up in your your book really eloquently. Um, really, you know, children from birth to college or trade school um, are oftentimes uh, non-drivers, and people that can't afford a car is an, another uh, 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 area of of non-drivers. So, um, really, getting them to the uh, testimony stand um, to hear hear their stories um, um, in front of decision makers is, is something that we work really hard to do. Yeah, for, for sure, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Joshua, I appreciate it. We'll, we'll dive in more as we keep going. Um, and one thing you, you just sort of touched on that sort of leads to my next question uh, for, for Anna um, is about non-drivers and what exactly that means. And it's something you kind of maybe even one of your first chapters of the book, I don't, I don't remember exactly where, but 
you kind of dive right in about what you're talking about with non-drivers and how you define the term. Uh, could you maybe just talk a little bit more about that, how you define non-drivers in the book and why is it important to think about that? Sorry, put myself on mute because the kid just got home from school and uh, a lot of noise. Almost the last day of school here and there's much excitement. Um, we also have a block party today, so there's a high energy in the house. But um, yeah, so, I, you know, Joshua got at some of these pieces and I think, you know, for me, I, I came to start using this term non-driver um, and I realized that it's not a perfect term, um, but for me, it's a very useful term because it allows us to talk about communities that have similar access needs. Um, when you talk about just disabled people, you know, there, there's many people who can't drive and maybe can't drive because of a disability, but wouldn't necessarily define themselves as or identify as disabled. I myself really didn't feel comfortable using that word until my mid thirties, even though I've had this disability uh, my whole life. There's so much stigma, um, so much ableism. And also just, you know, people perhaps who have anxiety or chronic health conditions or just the, the word disability doesn't feel like an appropriate way to describe um, their, you know, the, the, the factors that make it not possible for them to drive. So that's that's part of people who can't drive, right? People who can't drive because of a disability, um, whether or not they, they self-identify as disabled. And then there's folks who are aging out of driving, uh, you know, seniors, we know that, you know, the ARP has done a lot of work in this area and their level of communities work. Um, most Americans will spend between seven and 10 years of their lives unable to drive at the end. And so, you know, that, that's a lot of people, something we really need to think about too, um, as, you know, my parents' generation, the boomers age out of driving. Um, how, how is that going to work? And then um, there's folks who can't afford to drive. Cars are expensive. Driving is expensive. Um, and if for, for low-income folks, it, you know, uh, owning a car and maintaining a car can can suck up a lot of a household's income. And, uh, you know, as a result of racialized poverty in our country, we know that black households are three times less likely to have a car than white, white households. Um, there's also a lower uh, car ownership um, in a lot of our tribal communities here in Washington state um, and a lot of immigrant households. Um, many uh, folks who are recent immigrants or refugees to the U.S. don't have driver's licenses um, and maybe cannot afford cars, don't know how to drive. Um, it wasn't, you know, such a requirement from where in, in, where, in the countries where they came from uh, for participating in, in daily life and, and in the workforce. And then there's young folks. And I think this is a really important uh, piece to talk about because a big percentage of that third of us who are non-drivers are young people under the age of 16 or young people who are over the age of 16 and are increasingly choosing not to get driver's licenses. And I think, you know, um, the, we saw an increase in, in, in my generation and um, in millennials who were young and chose not to get driver's licenses. And, and then as we got older and perhaps were priced out further from city centers, um, those, those numbers decreased. Gen Z now uh, is increasingly choosing not to get driver's licenses. I think there's some really encouraging statistics around, you know, like in, in the 90s when I was a teen, around 50% of 16 year olds got driver's licenses. That's down to 20% now. Um, so really, you know, a big decrease in young folks either choosing to or perhaps not affording, being able to afford to uh, get driver's licenses and pay for insurance and, um, you know, deal with driving. So all together, a big community of folks um, and then there's folks who are choosing not to drive, right? Um, and that's another piece too that I think, you know, the voluntary non-drivers. Um, and, and they have similar needs too, perhaps not always the same as people who are not choosing not to drive, but all together, um, there's a lot of us and we really can push for changes in zoning and housing and land use and transportation um, to make our communities work better. Yeah, thank you. I have, before I kind of move on, do you do you have, um, you know, any data? Have you seen any kind of, you know, good analysis on why teens, you know, who are approaching the age at which they could drive are increasingly choosing not to get a driver's license? Do you know what that trend's about? I haven't. You know, there was a Washington Post article last summer that dug into this a little bit. And, and a lot of the data that I uh, looked at came from that article. Um, they were looking at census data and they interviewed some folks. I think there was definitely folks that, you know, the climate piece. Um, was a piece of it, right? And I, I, I would love to see more research um, and understand, you know, 
um, what, what, what the reasons are people are not choosing to drive. I think there's also some anxiety around driving um, and, and the stress of, you know, potential crashes. And then there's probably also, you know, with the increasing insurance costs, probably a financial piece too. Uh, and so I would, I would love to see more. If anyone knows that, um, please share. Maybe we can talk about it more in the, in the, in the chat. Yeah, same. Thank you. That's super, that's super interesting. Um, so we're, I think we're talking a lot about um, coalition building a little bit when, when we're talking about who's a non, who's a driver, who's a non-driver. Um, Anna, one of the things you mentioned in your book is that 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 group of non-drivers that you just mentioned are also people that are generally not well represented in the political system. So there's like a lack of political traditional political power that sits with that group of non-drivers. Um, so the question I want to kick a question over to Joshua. I'm wondering if you could share any examples from your work in Minnesota of, of how your transportation advocacy work has been made more effective or enriched by centering those non-drivers. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the question, Jesse. Um, one of the things that we're constantly hearing is, and uh, Anna brings this up in the book too, is how there's assumption out there and uh, a dialogue that everyone drives and um and everyone that doesn't drive um it's kind of pushing the margins and to combat that um and I, I said this in my introduction a little bit earlier giving those those folks a voice whatever um kind of community they they come from or whatever reason um they don't drive uh, is, is really critical. And especially when, um, decisions are being made about funding or a particular project, um, is being debated, uh, uh, a street project, if you will. Um, so, uh, making sure that, uh, folks have a voice when they're, you know, at public hearings, so their stories can be heard, um, I think it's a very compelling um, way to to um, influence decision makers, um, whether it's uh, a street reconstruction or a statewide, uh, you know, transportation funding uh, bill. Yeah, thank thank you. That's really really important. I think. Um, so I'm kind of looking at the clock. Um, I want to get out of your way a little bit. Um, I, I'd love it if you two, uh, I think maybe you both have some questions for each other. Um, so I think right now I want to maybe step back and, and let you two lead the discussion a little bit more. Um, I thought I'd kick it over to Anna for a first crack at asking Joshua a question. Definitely. Yeah, no, and this is a, a, a new kind of experimental format, but I wanted us to be able to chat. And I think, you know, when, when Jesse first approached me about doing this webinar, I was so excited um, and I was really excited to have this conversation about climate and with the Sierra Club because I grew up in Washington State. My dad worked for the Department of Natural Resources as a biologist, so grew up, you know, talking a lot about environmental protection, climate change, um, you know, in spaces where, where environmentalism was really central. Um, and yet there wasn't really a conversation about transportation and climate. And I, I wanted to ask Joshua, you know, in the work that you've been doing, how has that conversation, how have you been able to really help people who care very deeply about environmental protection and about climate change start to see those connections and understand how it's also, you know, we need to be talking about land use and housing and transportation um, and really focusing on those issues too. Uh, yeah, well, I'll start with the fact that uh, one of my first jobs was um, building trail in Washington State uh, in the Cascades uh, with the Student Conservation Association. I was leading a high school crew of uh, of uh, eight youth uh, for five weeks in the woods. And um, so that was my start to uh, uh, conservation and, and advocacy. Um, and uh, I think that is uh, a testimony to a lot of uh, what uh, a stereotypical Sierra Club member supporter is. Uh, they care about uh, um, the environment um, and, and wilderness and conservation. So connecting the dots is really critical. And um, with the rise of concern uh, of the climate crisis, 
um, connecting the dots uh, to climate pollution and transportation being the number one contributor to climate pollution, I think is a compelling argument that that um, that works uh, to uh, elevate the 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 need to to really start addressing um, uh, climate from a from the transportation and land use perspective um, because that's how we're gonna really tackle this thing. Um, it's the number one contributor to climate change pollution in um, Minnesota and and the nation and in in most states, uh, especially as we clean up the grid um, and uh, and uh, transition to clean renewable energy. So uh, that's that's what works for for uh, the arguments. But I wanted to share a couple of tactics that we've used. Um, locally here in Minnesota that um, has been really helpful. Um, a typical member of the Sierra Club, at least in Minnesota, I'll speak um, locally, uh, drives. And they might drive an electric vehicle uh, or not, but, uh, but most of our members and supporters drive. So one of the ways to introduce them to uh, getting around in another uh, form of travel is is uh, what we dubbed uh, transit to green space, where we'll take uh, a bus or a train and um, and build an outing, uh, outdoor uh, adventure, if you will, whether it's snowshoeing in the in the in the winter or skiing and lugging that equipment onto a bus or, or a, a train uh, and exploring a, an urban or a suburban green space. Um, so just getting people out using what's there. And when you do that, you see how challenging it can be. Um, and uh, and it also just introduces folks in a very uh, open way, um, going in with as a group, learning how to use your, your transit pass and all that. So, um, and, and we've done a lot of bike tours as well. Uh, we started uh, over 25 years ago, the what was first called the Tour de Sprawl. It was a conference on wheels with rest stops along the way with guest speakers talking about uh, urban sprawl and the challenges of, of that. Um, now it's the Sierra Club bike tour, uh, but it's a similar uh, format of, of around 15 miles and speakers talking about different uh, transportation or land use issues al along the way. So just- I love that Tour de Sprawl idea, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, it's uh it's been picked up by a couple other entities across this the years, but yes, we've been at it for well over uh 25 years here. Uh if you go to our website, you can see all the places we visited. That gets me to something else. I'm going to ask you and then then I'll let you <laughs> ask me something. But uh I um was I've been getting in my I think like my Google news feed lots of articles about St. Paul considering a ban on drive-throughs and I know uh, Minneapolis has done it already. Um, it's something I think about a lot because the coffee shop closest to us throughout the pandemic, all the other ones had closed, um, was a Starbucks and it was a drive through only Starbucks. And they refused to serve you if you weren't in a car. And I, I figured out a, a hack where if I ordered online, they didn't want to deal with like refunding me. So they would actually give me the coffee. But um, they I felt bad for the the individual workers there who it wasn't their choice. But it was it's frustrating um, that in you know the heart of Seattle, we have drive through only establishments and um, wanted to just like talk about sort of that land use piece of you know, what you experience when you're biking in a place that's really designed for cars, you know, you're having to cross drive through, you know, entrances and giant parking lots and giant setbacks of buildings for giant parking lots. And um, yeah, I think, you know, if, if, how how that's shaping the conversation and um, in in uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis and and what you've seen with the drive through ban, if that's having any impact. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, Minneapolis, our largest city in Minnesota, uh, did ban uh, new drive throughs so existing ones were, were grandfathered in, if you will. Uh, and now St. Paul's looking at that same policy change. Um, and, you know, what we've seen is uh, that drive throughs perpetuate, right, a driving culture. Um, and they, uh, and, and what we want to do is, is the opposite, right? 
Uh, I also um, found it interesting in your book, Anna, that, you know, there's been um, some states or municipalities that have um, passed ordinances or laws um, mandating or requiring that uh, people walking or biking or rolling can use a drive through because uh, I've had that experience myself, riding my bike up to uh, actually a bank drive through and them not uh, um, serving me um, until I locked my bike and walked it, walked inside. So, um, you know, what we need to do when we're building out our cities um, and allowing uh, new uses um, is think about, you know, is this going to increase VMT, vehicle miles traveled, uh, you know, or is it going to um, work against that paradigm um, and help shift it uh, to uh, really making it friendlier, safer, more accessible for, for people walking, biking, uh, whether they're coming off a bus or a train um, or rolling uh, to, to uh, um, use a service or, or uh, get that, that cup of coffee. Totally. I can ask another question too. <laughs> um, because and I think this is sort of a more pointed follow up. I mean, like something I wrestle with, right? I did a book talk in my hometown a couple of weeks ago, and I knew that my folks and all their friends are going to be in the audience. And it's like this, like, okay, you know, I'm an environmentalist, but I want to live in the woods because I like trees. Therefore, I need to drive. Um, how how does the Sierra Club, how do you, how do you figure out what, how do you respond to that? Like what, how do we start to have conversations with people about what those choices or those preferences mean for our communities? Um, and that those choices and preferences leave out people like, you know, children um, and, and adult, the disabled you know, children, adult children who can't drive if that's where, you know, housing is and that's where you're choosing to live. Right. Yes. Uh, well, I was very fortunate to uh, to have a sabbatical last year with the Sierra Club last summer, and I spent it in um, in uh, in Europe actually, and it was just a, a, a reminder of of how compact uh, urban areas are are so green um, when you can walk uh, or use transit literally for everything. And um, because as I keep saying, transportation is the number one contributor to climate change, but it also emits all kinds of other pollution, right? Smog and, and everything else that we, we breathe in, uh, it pollutes our waters. Um, and uh, and um, by promoting uh, communities where you can, uh, you, your child, your aging parent can all get to where they need to go um, without necessarily having to drive a single occupancy vehicle um, is something that is very good for the environment. Um, when we build uh, track housing in the exurbs or uh, you know rural areas, it takes a lot of resources, A, to get uh, out to those areas, whether it's sewer, electricity, natural gas, and whatnot, um, and then provide services like police and fire and, and everything else, um, that those are very damaging to, uh, practices to, to the environment. Um, and uh, not to mention the, the impacts of, of uh, building in these areas and uh, the loss of natural resources uh, or farmland. Or, um, so, so there's a lot of uh challenges to 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 sprawl uh if you will and um what we could do to combat that is things like what minneapolis uh did in 2018 which is to rewrite their comprehensive plan to legalize um uh uh single or uh triplexes throughout the city um uh, whereas before um two-thirds of the city was zoned for single family homes which makes infill development which combats sprawl um a lot uh a lot more feasible yeah no totally i mean one thing i think about is like how much we're gonna 
have to reckon with the cost of some of this exurban development as you know roads need repaving infrastructure needs rebuilding um climate change is damaging um infrastructure more quickly um and in washington state we have this huge uh amount of work we need to do around restoring culverts uh, because of salmon habitat. And I mean, there's a lot of increasing knowledge around, you know, the impacts of tire dust on, on, you know, salmon, and maybe that's a big part of the problem too. But we also have all these culverts that block salmon uh, from going upstream. And I think about the neighborhood where I grew up in is, you know, it's out this rural road and it crosses two or three little creeks that could be salmon runs. Um, and it's up to the county. I mean, to, to repair those culverts, but the amount of money that's going to take in, a, in every county, right, to do that. Plus, there's all the state roads, you know, city roads. There's just, you know, this huge amount of, of work that we're just starting to wrap our heads around, I think, as a state um, that we're going to have to do for, for uh, you know, culvert repair. And that's not a cost that was really considered when, when these communities were built out in, you know, out in the woods. So uh, I think that's, that should be part of the conversation. Are we moving to uh, to to group uh, questions now, Jesse? Is that? I think we got time. If if you have one more another question you'd like to ask either of you, Josh, if you want to ask anything to Anna, you know, I think we got time. Maybe five more minutes for that. So, cool. uh, I have a question for Anna, um, and I, I guess we didn't talk about this earlier, but um, in your conversations with uh, with with non drivers, uh, how often did did land use come up over transportation options or vice versa, or is it kind of equal hmm. as, yeah, ch as, as challenges? Yeah. Curious. I mean, I think people aren't thinking about it in those terms necessarily, right? It takes like, you know, people aren't sort of in these, these bubbles where there's a lot of discourse around transit or housing or land use. Um, the people that that we really tried to 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 seek out and collect stories from were folks who were you know um themselves perhaps not able to go places not able to be involved with groups um not necessarily connected into these like urbanist or transportation or housing spaces right um so i think people thought of it more in terms of well you know i can't afford to live in a city where there is good frequent transit i'm living out with my parents in the community I grew up in, because that's where housing is affordable, um, and there's no transit. I'm outside of paratransit service. There's no sidewalks, so I can't even walk a mile. I mean, I, I, even if, if it, I would be willing to walk a mile or two into town, but it's not safe because there's no sidewalks on this road. And so I think, you know, the, the people's experience, it's all of those things together. Um, but perhaps they're not like aware of, you know, the vocabulary that, that that planners use, right, to talk about it. Part of the work I'm doing right now is figuring out, can we, like the, the communities that are experiencing this, non-drivers and particularly involuntary non-drivers have a lot of experience thinking about transportation and planning because we are, you know, for many hours of the day walking down a road thinking about how it could be safer for pedestrians or waiting at a bus stop thinking about how it could be more comfortable or a crossing could be safer, um, you know, transit routes could be better. Like we, we spend a lot of time, way more time thinking about transportation and, and participating in transportation, I think, than, than people who can drive just because it takes so much longer not to drive to get places and all the prep you have to do to plan um, those routes. Uh, but we're not really incorporated into a lot of the decision-making structures around, you know, how, how this all gets planned. Um, and, and perhaps because we don't have the right vocabulary, right? We're not, um, people haven't had the opportunity to go to school or be involved in advocacy work. Uh, and so I'm really interested in how we, we sort of bridge that gap and help people feel like they have the skills and knowledge to participate and also, you know, help them understand some of the vocabulary so they can participate in conversations and feel like, you know, they know what's going on and they know what all these terms mean. Um, because it's something that I think I didn't really understand how much I knew about transportation because I hadn't gone to planning school. I hadn't, you know, worked in the industry um, for years, but I did have this knowledge. And I think in participating in a community in a, an equity transportation group that was run by our, our um, King County Metro, our transit agency, it was a, a paid group. And I, I really actively participated in, in it for a full year. And that experience, I think, helped me sort of 
understand my own knowledge and power. And I, we're trying to do that with more folks um, and help them sort of see that. So I think that's, yeah, it went off in a different direction, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that's really a big focus of, and, and, and passion of mine right now is, is how to, how to, how to help people, um, yeah, be engaged and change who's in the room when these things are getting discussed and decided. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. Um, one thing that uh, came to mind while you're where you're talking about that is is how complicated, and I think all the silos are. But uh, when we start talking about terms and, um, but how complicated transportation planning is, especially in urban areas, because you know you could be in downtown Seattle or downtown Minneapolis or downtown New York, and there could be a multitude of different agencies that own or manage or operate, you know, a city street within the city. It could be the city, it could be the county, it could be the, you know, the state or a combination thereof. So uh, it, it is complicated for, for folks to um, learn the processes and these, uh, these projects take years and years sometimes to plan and uh, fund and, and then actually build. So um, there's, there's a lot of challenges to, uh, to, to engaging in in uh, in, in project uh, uh, influencing projects, yeah, yeah, no, and uh, it's so true. I think yeah, we we ran this what we call the non driver seminar um, with Disability Rights Washington, which is my my employer, and uh, we uh, it was you know just trying to explain what an MPO was to people like a metropolitan planning organization, right? And like like some of these you know the structures, the different levels of governance that are involved in transportation planning. Um, it, it was a lot. Uh, and I, the folks who did that actually came out and wrote a report at the end about what they learned and what their recommendations are and what they'd like to see. So uh, you can, if you if you Google non-driver seminar, I think it comes up. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's you know it, it is sort of I don't think it's intentionally obtuse, but it it definitely feels like it can exclude people and make people feel like they can't participate. And then the timelines of these projects, you know, it's so easy to burn out um, and not be able to to you know be an advocate. <laughs> And that intensely for so long. Um, and, and when stuff happens quickly, it almost is like, oh, wow, that's too easy. We should have asked for something bigger. We got a sidewalk built recently in Seattle and it only took like two years. And I'm like, oh, man, um, that was fast. Uh, but yeah, maybe we should be. Well, well, we are asking for more. Right. Thanks, you too. I'm going to maybe pivot us to some of the, the audience Q&A. Uh, there's been a bunch of questions that have been submitted. I probably won't be able to get to them all. I'm going to pick some of them. Uh, if I don't get your question, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just having to make choices on the fly here. So blame me, not, not the panelists. Um, one thing you just said uh, just struck a chord with me. It only took two years to build a sidewalk, and that was quick. Up, <laughs> up, up in my neighborhood in, in North Seattle, there is a uh, planned about a half mile long straight shot mixed use path. Um, connecting where I live up to the new 130th Street light rail station that'll mm -hmm. open in a couple of years. And it's going to take like two years of design. I mean, it's literally a 12 foot wide pathway, like it goes, <laughs> it's a half a mile. It shouldn't take, we need to learn how to do these things quicker. I'll get off my soapbox and uh, switch over to some of the audience questions. Um, I want to maybe, maybe start with kind of a a harder one or maybe one that, that that's a little bit of a, of a challenge to what you've been talking about. Um, this question asks, what about the cultural effects of decrease or less some freedom to do things like drive out to a forest or a walk or attend a class? Like it's uh, now with a car, a person has great freedom that would be greatly constrained if access ended where the bus or train ended. So what I think I think that saying is kind of how do you how do you think about um, how do you think about free you know I, I guess um, I'll just I'll just kind of let let you respond to that question. So I could jump in real quick about how I talk about and we've done polling on this um, not getting people out of their cars because that is uh i think that hits on what what this question is is driving at is like you know people appreciate their freedom and don't want that freedom taken away from them 
by, you know, folks telling them they shouldn't be driving anymore or should be driving a lot less. So uh, whenever I hear the uh, uh, messaging about, you know, we, we need to get more people out of their cars, um, I, I, I push back and I try not to use that in, in my messaging. What we need to do is provide better options for people uh, for walking, for biking, for rolling, for taking the bus, for taking the train, uh, for tele uh, commuting. Um, because we know that when we make it safer, more accessible, more affordable for people, um, and we improve uh, access and service for uh, transit, uh, people start using it. And um, I think that's the uh, messaging that we really need to 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 move forward with um, is is increasing options. Choices uh, is another word, uh, depending on which poll you read. Um, uh, but uh, but really, you know, improving the options so it's just as fast to take transit as it is to uh, drive your car and then find a parking spot and then walk to where you're going um, is just an example. Yeah, I mean, I would I would build off that. I think the just as fast thing is so important um, because, you know, when you're figuring out how to get somewhere, if you have choices, you're going to go look on Google and you're going to say, OK, like in Seattle, it often is 15 minutes to drive and an hour and a half on transit. Right. So if you have a choice, you're going to drive. Like, why would you spend that hour and a half on transit, two hours on transit to get somewhere um, that I was in Vancouver, B.C. yesterday and I looked up you know, where it was to get from the Amtrak station to the, the suburb where I was going to be at a conference. And it was, I think it was 29 minutes to, to take transit and 26 minutes to drive, or maybe it was the other way around. And I was so excited to see that like near equivalency, like that, you know, I, that's where we need to get. And in, when you look in New York City too, it's often longer to drive than take the subway. Um, and, and it's until we get to the place where transit or biking or walking are the rational choice, are what's easier for people who can choose, um, I think we're not going to see systemic change. Um, and I do like, I, you know, for me, it's like, it, you know, I, I, this isn't a moral thing about people making choices and like you should choose to give up your car, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think it's important to remember there's a third of people who don't have that choice already. Um, and we need to make it if we're if we actually want to reduce car dependency, then we need to make it the rational choice not to take a car somewhere. Um, and we we just don't do that right now. We we make it it's so much easier to drive places um, and cheaper usually and faster. And those are all choices of how we prioritize funding um, and what you know roads we build and you know um, all of all of those go into all of that goes into um, making driving easier and faster for people and then people choose it uh, because it is yeah. who have that choice yeah. there's a bumper sticker out there no it's a bike sticker actually uh that i came across recently and it's a bus and it says frequency is freedom mm -hmm. uh, and uh you could even add to that uh, uh fast and frequent is freedom um but with a bus not a car yeah. so yeah. And we could do this with active transportation infrastructure too, right? Like it's not right. just transit, right? Like I think about um, cities in Europe that have prioritized biking and, you know, multimodal bike paths um, as the direct and easy route to get places. And if you're going to go somewhere in the car, it's going to take longer because you're going to have to take a more circuitous route. That is the opposite of what the city of Seattle does, where in the South Seattle, where I live, the direct routes and the flat routes are for cars. And if you want a bike, you're taking these, you know, two or three times longer and way hillier routes um, on a bike. And so, of course, people are going to drive. Right. It's yeah. Thanks, both of you. I got another question. It's maybe uh, maybe a bit of a follow up. One or both of you can take this one. Um, how do you feel about Governor Hochul's recent, uh, recently placing uh, on indefinite pause the congestion pricing fee for driving into Lower Manhattan? Uh, just the answer that we were just talking about kind of remind you know this question seemed like it fit because we're talking about making um, not driving a more rational choice. I wonder, I mean, is there? But we're also we also don't want to make it seem like we're trying to punish drivers. We're trying to you know 
create more choices for people to get on get around without a car. So I just wonder how you um yeah what you thought of that development and Sierra Club does we have supported the congestion pricing proposal in New York City for um but I just wondered if you had any thoughts either of you. So I can start. I mean, you know, obviously, like part of it's the, you know, the congestion pricing to get less cars into Manhattan, but that's also the funding, right? It's going to raise for accessibility with MTA for MTA upgrades, right? Like there's a huge funding gap that I think is part of that that really needs to be focused on. But for me, you know, not living in New York City anymore, what was so sort of shocking about that development was New York City is one of the few places in this country where most people don't drive most places, right? And a lot of the messaging around congestion pricing emphasize, or, you know, emphasize that, right? That most people don't drive into lower Manhattan. Um, and yet this narrative that everyone drives or everyone needs to drive still won. And I think that just shows us how much work we need to do to sort of shift this window of, you know, that there are a lot of non-drivers. There's actually like early a lot of non-drivers in New York and there's a lot of non-drivers in the rest of the country too, but that invisibility or the like, well, you know, real people with real things to do need to drive narrative. So yeah, Joshua, I don't know if you. Yeah, not too much to add there. Uh, yeah, the, except that it's it's kind of setting us uh, backwards in, in many ways, especially in our most urban dense, you know, uh, parts of, of of our nation. So, uh, so it was kind of dismaying. Um, it's not something we've been able to even fathom, uh, tackling, um, here in flyover country of the Midwest, uh, maybe Chicago, but, uh, downtown, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think Anna, you're right. It's, it's, uh, it's just a demonstration of, of how much work we have, have, uh, ahead of us. I have another question that's going to serve as like a great pivot to the next the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is week without driving. So the, this question comes from Marjorie in Berkeley. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and it's, do you oppose highway expansion and or widening? And, you know, talking about the pros and cons of that. And then relatedly, what are various Sierra Club chapters doing in recognition of week without driving? Um, so let's talk a little about week without driving um, first. And we can get to the highway piece as we're talking through it. Um, this is the first year that the National Sierra Club will be a partner on the Week Without Driving Challenge. Um, there has been um, other chapters who have been engaged for several years, including the North Star chapter, I believe. So um, maybe start starting with with Anna. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about what Week Without Driving is and why and why it's important? Totally. Yeah. So it started back, uh, we launched it in Washington State in 2021. And the idea was we'd done all this story collecting around the needs of non-drivers and, and these profiles, and they were focused on legislative districts in our state, every legislative district. And we wanted a way to connect those to the decision makers who are then going to be discussing a, a transportation funding package. And, and so um, the idea was, well, let's have these elected leaders try to experience a little bit about what it's like to be a non-driver and maybe partner them with non-drivers from their district to have a conversation then um, about the things that need to change to make our systems work better um, for, uh, you know, for non-drivers. And so that's where the idea came from. Uh, we launched in 2021. Um, we weren't sure what was going to happen. We had some 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 early adopters and um, uh, Councilmember Tammy Morales from Seattle, I think, was one of our early champions. It was really great to have folks not really knowing what it was going to be like join us um, and trust that this was something worth participating in. In 2022, I think we had around uh, you know, 400 participants uh, from across our state. And then in 2023, we kept on getting uh, emails and calls from other folks from other states being like, we want to do this. Can we do it? How can we do it? And so we partnered with America Walks and they have a terrific organizer there, Ruth Rosas, who's um, the, doing a lot of the national coordination for a week without driving. And so last year was our first national uh, year, had participation from organizations in 41 states, which was just mind blowing to me. Um, and this year we're going for all 50 and really excited um, to continue to, to build the challenge and have support of National Sierra Club. And um, I don't even, I mean, it's 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 wonderful because it's something that each group can sort of do with, with what they want. And I would love to hear more about what Joshua's experience is like, because I think every community did something a little different and had different responses. 
um, and, you know, used it in different ways, but that's sort of the beauty of the challenge is that it does allow that, that local, um, you know, focus. Yeah, so impressive. Uh, Minnesota uh, did a pilot, if you will, uh, years ago um, called, we, we called it hashtag how we roll MN. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but similar concept, uh, we just got um, public elected officials um, trying uh, transit. Uh, shout out to our uh, retiring uh, house transportation uh, chair, uh, Frank Hornstein, representative in the state house, who's who's uh, stepping down from years of of uh, transit advocacy, um, he uh, does not drive um, and chairs our transportation uh, house co committee, and so he was a big part of it. As was um, then Lieutenant Governor uh, Tina Smith, who is now our U.S. Uh, Senator representing um, Minnesota in Congress. Um, and, and other elected officials. And um, we, we, we are fortunate to have one of our two uh, existing light rail lines in uh, the Twin Cities uh, serve the capital. Um, so uh, we use the light rail uh, to, uh, to get a bunch of uh, uh, elected officials um, well, to their job that day. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just a great way to um, demonstrate uh, you know that uh, even even state officials can can uh, can can ride ride the train to uh, to to the capital. So yeah, so to answer kind of the original question from from Marjorie, I'll just let you know that we're planning on getting some more um, tools out to our local chapters and groups that might be interested in participating in Week Without Driving this year. Of course, there's a whole there's a whole spectrum of actions that folks can take from kind of individual participation to getting elected officials on board to local proclamations or events. And hopefully we'll have a diversity of, of ways that folks are engaged in, in tactics and tactics we'll, and we'll make it uh, something that uh, Sierra Club is really excited about this year. So, um, so thank, thanks for the question. Thanks for all your work with on Week Without Driving, both of you, Anna and Joshua. Um, I kind of one last question to, to just to wrap up our webinar before before the top of the hour. Um, and this one's for Anna, but first I just want to mention the book. Um, again, there's a link in the chat if you'd like to buy the book. There's a 30% discount code with the code webinar. And both Joshua and I read the book um, in preparation for having this chat. Loved it. I had the ebook copy, so I didn't get the market up the way that, that Joshua did, but um it's just so important and impactful for the work that we're all doing to create uh, a, a transportation system that works for everybody that actually gives people more choices besides driving a car that that makes it safer that makes it cleaner um to get to get around and to get where you need to go um i i got a lot out of it i think that all of you doing this work would get a lot out of it too so that's, that's my pitch. Um, and I want to wrap up with a question for Anna. You can tell us anything you'd like to tell us about the book or why you think it's awesome and everybody should buy it. Uh, but I also wanted to ask, um, is there one thing in the book that you think it's maybe most important for a Sierra Club audience to think more about or talk more about? Um, what, would, what would be the one thing you'd, or maybe we should ask about, what would be your kind of one, the one thing you'd like us to, to pay attention to or take away? Oh gosh, that's a, that's a really tough question. Um, I'm going to say something else while I think about an answer, but I would also, you know, I, I would love if you can buy the book, but I would also really love if you could request it from your local library, because I think that's a way to get it out there in, in hands of more folks. I know that King County Library here in Seattle Public Library are, have it on order. Um, we'll be doing some library events. And so just encourage you to, to put in that request to your library as well. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I um, am excited that Sierra Club is, is, is having this conversation around climate and transportation and access. And I think um, there's, it's so important right now um, for us to be thinking about, you know, how, how do people, 
how are people able to access our communities? And I think that is even more important as we're facing climate change and some of those risks and, and really understanding the disparities in those impacts and whether that's, you know, the ability to evacuate in a storm, um, the ability to sort of, you know, have the resources to mitigate many of the, like the smoke or the other things that we're, you know, having to mitigate. Um, understanding those 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 impacts and and thinking about transportation as part of that, um, and so when you see conversations and, and are part of conversations around climate change and um, just just thinking about the third of people who really can't just hop up and leave uh, at a short notice or easily, and so I guess that's that's my plug to to sort of think about and consider um, and bring into conversations that you may be having in your own states around how do we prepare uh, for for climate climate disasters. That's kind of a negative thing to end on. <laughs> Maybe there's something more positive Joshua can share. Um, yeah, I just, uh, you, your point uh, reminded me of something that I always uh, drive home in these conversations and, and, and you bring it up in the book several times is that we cannot address climate change in the transportation sector by electrification alone. Um, we have to also, you know, you know, even if every single one of us on this call and in the country, you know, switches to an electric vehicle, um, it's not going to reduce the emissions um, to the point that we need to. And so, uh, you know, for Sierra Clubbers, if you will, we also have to do what uh, the lingo is, reduce VMT, uh, reduce vehicle miles traveled. That's how much we're driving. Um, especially in in areas that um, can easily support uh, you know transit and um, in doing so we're also um, working to improve uh, access for non-drivers so uh, you know it's a win-win so I, I just wanted to kind of get that in everyone's um, thought process as well is is uh, you know it's it's there, there's no silver bullet I hate using that term but uh, to transportation and climate, um, it's it's uh, multi-tiered and it also involves um, promoting and and um, increasing access for for everyone, um, no matter how they get around or would like to get around. Yes, is that more positive? That's more positive. Then definitely more positive. <laughs> I have another positive. It's a thank you. Uh, she's been hiding in the background, but Rebecca Wilden with our Clean Transportation for All campaign. Hi, finally off camera, uh, has been helping run this call today. Uh, Rebecca is a rock star and one of Sierra Club's, uh, you know, foremost experts on staff on land use and transportation issues and the intersection between them and is a Charlotte Planning Commissioner and an awesome colleague. So thank you for everything. Rebecca, thanks to all of you for joining today. And thank you to our panelists, Joshua and Anna, and for all the amazing work that you do. So thank you. Appreciation. We'll log off now, but thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye.